Now turn with me tonight to John's Gospel, chapter 2. John's Gospel, chapter 2. <coughs> And I want to read from verse 12. So we're breaking into the chapter. John's Gospel, chapter 2. <coughs> and look with me at verse 12. John's Gospel, chapter 2, verse 12. Let's hear the word of the Lord. After this he went down to Capernaum, he and his mother and his brethren and his disciples. And they continued there not many days. And the Jews' Passover was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem, and found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves, and the changers of the money sitting. And when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple, and the sheep and the oxen, and poured out the changers' money, and overthrew the tables, and said unto them that sold doves, Take these things hence, make not my father's house an house of merchandise. And the disciples remembered that it was written, The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. Then answered the Jews and said unto him, What sign showest thou unto us, seeing that thou doest these things? Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building. And wilt thou rear it up in three days? <coughs> but he spake of the temple of his body. When therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this unto them. And they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover in the feast day, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself unto them, because he knew all men, and needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. Amen. We'll end the reading there at verse 25, and we pray that God will stamp with his own approval and blessing this reading of the Holy Scriptures. Now my text tonight is taken from John chapter 2 and the verse 29. And my subject this evening is the raising up of the temple of Christ's body. Now here's the text, John 2 and 19. Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. There used to be a man in the Enniskillen Independent Methodist Church, a dear friend of the Reverend Tom Cross, and he used to say that if the preacher sticks to the text, the text will stick to the people. And of course, there's a lot of wisdom and truth in that. I want you to notice in this text the words, I will raise it up. Two words, I will. Christ, of course, is making a statement that's full of intention, a statement that's backed home with power and ability to fulfill it. Uh, sadly, often we're full of good intentions. We say to others, we say to ourselves, I'm going to do this or I will do that. <coughs> of course, it's subject to the will of God. And then situations arise, circumstances occur, and we can't actually fulfill what we have said or attended. Maybe it's a letter to someone. Maybe it's a phone call. Uh, uh, maybe it's a card. Uh, and of course, if it's me and I've got the memory of a goldfish, uh, the thought is crowded out with other thoughts and then it's gone and I usually remember weeks later or, or maybe even months later and as I've been advised to do to, to write out a schedule and, and then at least I can tick them off when I do the thing but the Lord Jesus of course is not like us he's holy he's harmless he's undefiled 
He's the incarnate Son of God. And if he says he's going to do something, he does it. When he says I will, he's not only full of good intention, but he's got power and ability to fulfill what he has said. He's got the proper mindset to carry it out. And I'm well aware that there's loads of I wills in the Bible. We could preach a whole series. You could probably preach 52 uh, Sunday nights from a different text each Sunday night of the year on the words I will. But I want you to think of these words. I will raise it up. You see, the Lord Jesus is at the very start of his ministry here. He has just attended the wedding feast at Cana of Galilee. And I want to tell you, there's nothing wrong with having a wedding feast and attending that. Afterwards, maybe a few days later, the Lord Jesus, when he was down in Capernaum, learned that the uh, time had come round for the Jews' Passover. It was at hand. So he went up to Jerusalem. And when he was in Jerusalem to celebrate the feast of the Passover, there he proceeded to cleanse the temple. Look at verse 16. And said unto them that sold doves, Take these things hence, make not my father's house an house of merchandise. And of course immediately the Jewish leaders demanded a sign from him for his authority in cleansing the temple. And here was his answer. Destroy this temple. And in three days I will raise it up. Now there's no doubt that this is not a literal command to destroy a literal temple. He was pointing to himself when he just said, destroy this temple. He was referring, of course, to his own body. Look at verse 21. But he spake of the temple of his own body. He was thinking of the day of his crucifixion. And as I've said, this was not a literal command. This was a, 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 a statement uh, that, that he was making. He was thinking of that day when he'd been nailed to the tree and shed his blood. And of course, the Jews completely misunderstood Christ. They thought he was referring to Herod's temple. Look at verse 20. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? <coughs> I want you to understand tonight that in the Bible, Solomon's temple was mentioned in the Old Testament. It was a beautiful building, a wonder of the ancient world. In fact, um, those that have studied the architecture of Solomon's temple said that you could fit four St. Paul's of London inside the temple and its precincts. An amazing edifice. And of course it was destroyed by the Babylonians in 586 BC. Then, at 70 years later, Zerubbabel uh, came to rebuild the uh, temple uh, foundations again. And that was looked upon as the second temple. And of course it was the role of ne Nehemiah and Ezra to finish it. And by the time of Christ, the second temple was in a state of disrepair. Uh, in the days of Christ, it was there for being repaired and renovated. Of course, it was another beautiful structure, and commentators tell us that this work began about 20 BC. That's 20 years before Christ. And they tell us it continued until about 64 AD. So that was 84 years in construction. And you're hoping that next door we're not going to be 84 years in construction because you're going to be saying, well, there'll be none of us here, not even amongst the young uh, tonight. The Lord Jesus, when he said destroy this temple, was not speaking of a temple of bricks and mortar. He, he was not thinking of any material structure. He was thinking of about a temple that was more worthy and more beautiful and more special than any temple built by man. The temple of his body. And we're going to think tonight about the raising up of the temple 
of Christ's body. Now notice three things. The particulars of this temple. Let's refresh our minds. Just like the tabernacle was made after a divine pattern, so the temple was made after a divine pattern. And there were three parts to the tabernacle and the temple. As I've said, it was made after a specific pattern. You had the outer court, then you had an inner court with the holy place, and then you had another place called the most holy place, or the Holy of Holies. Now, now think of the outer gate, the outer court. When you come in through the gate, the first item that you would see would be the brazen altar, just like the tabernacle. That was the place of sacrifice. That was the place where animals were brought and killed and sacrificed. Their blood was caught in the basin, and then it was sprinkled upon the altar. In other words, the brazen altar was the place of sacrifice and the shed blood. And maybe you're thinking, well, how does that relate to Christ? It relates to Christ in this sense that the place called Calvary is the place where Jesus Christ was crucified and shed his blood. We don't have any altars in the church. The front of the new church building is not an altar. It won't be called an altar. And there won't be any altar calls. For we have no altar but Christ. And there's only one altar, true altar of sacrifice. And that's at the place called Calvary. Remember we read in Hebrews 12 or 10 and 12. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down in the right hand of God. You think of Jesus offering his sinless body to the Father as a substitute for sinners, as a sacrifice for sinners, being the sin bearer, uh, bearing the, the, the sins of his people, making himself a sin offering, bearing the wrath of God, being a surety for his people, having fulfilled the law. And we have to say tonight, there's no equal to this great sacrifice of the Savior. There's no equal of this great altar erected at Calvary. There's nothing on earth that can com compare to it. The question tonight for many is, who or what are you trusting in for heaven and home? How many tonight are trusting in their best efforts, their religiosity, their own righteousness? And you see, in the eyes of God, there was only one sacrifice ever good enough to open the door. For sinners to enter into heaven. And that was the sacrifice of Christ. And if he was the only one that was ever good enough. Then you have to trust in him. Who he is. What he is like. And what he has done. When you come into the outer court. Having come through the gate. And been to the brazen altar. The next item is the lever. The lever young people. Was like a big wash hand basin. You're familiar with a wash hand basin in your bathroom or your shower room. This um, big wash hand basin was, was made of brass. And what you did was, after the sacrifice was offered, you washed in the laver. After the brazen altar, you washed in the laver. Before you could proceed any further to go on into the uh, uh, holy place or the most holy place to, to meet with God or, or to serve the Lord, you had to come into contact with the laver. There had to be a washing. Doesn't the Bible talk about the washing of water by the word in Ephesians chapter 5? Didn't Jesus say in John 15 uh, to his disciples, Now you are clean through the word that I have spoken unto you? Again he says, Be ye clean that bear the vessels of the Lord. There has to be an inward uh, and an outward cleansing before we can go out and serve the Lord. There, there has to be a point where our, we, we come in contact with the washing of the water of the word. That is, we fill our hearts and minds with the word of God. Every word is true. Every word is pure. Every word is valuable. Can you get the picture? Coming into the tabernacle, coming into the temple, to meet with God, to, to serve the Lord. 
There had to be a washing in the blood of Christ. The blood had to be applied through sacrifice. And then there had to be a washing in the bath to be sanctified and set apart. The Bible tells us, 2 Timothy 4 and 2, preach the word, be instant in season and out of season. And of course, we in the Free Presbyterian Church, we believe in the centrality of the preaching of the word of God. We, we realize that we're not going to win souls by entertainment or, 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 or gimmicks. Isn't it sad today that we live in an age in the church when many, sadly, are not interested in the word of God? I believe that we need to call the church by way of reformation back to basics. We we're thinking about revival. And of course we need a revival of the preaching of the word of God. Where there's a hearing again for that word. Where people are asking is there any word from God. And more than that there's a heeding of that word. It's not just enough to hear. It has to be heeded and applied. And how many have heard the gospel and haven't heeded the gospel call, even to, to call on the Lord that they might be saved. Isn't the preaching of the word today sidelined? It's become an optional extra in many services. Five minutes, ten minutes, a, a little epilogue, a few thoughts. And the, the preaching of the word as a central act of worship is squeezed out. Now here's a thought. Who's called the word in the Bible. In John 1 and 1 we read. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. The same was in the beginning. With God. The Bible tells us in the, the verse 14. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. The glory of the only begotten of the father. Full of grace and truth. The word. He's the way in. And once you come in. The sin question is dealt with. You're put under the sprinkling of the blood. And then there's a washing of pure water. Which is symbolic of the word. And from that you can proceed on to have fellowship. And freshness with God. Think also. In the particulars of this temple, the inner court. Because once you pass the brazen altar and pass the brazen lever, you come to the holy place. And there's three items there. Let, let me tell you very quickly what they are. You've got the menorah. That's the golden lampstand. Remember, there's no windows in the tabernacle of the temple. The light in the holy place came from the lampstand. Who said, I am the light of the world? See, without Jesus Christ... The sinner, the saint, is in darkness. He has come to reveal and show himself to a dead and, and darkened world. The next item is the table of showbread. Showbread, what does that mean? It just means bread to be shown or, or bread to be displayed. It's a bit like um, cream crackers, young people. It's unleavened bread. It's not like our pan loaf or, or, or our uh, plain loaf. It, it's a very flat bread that's just lying on the table. As I've said, it's a bit like cream crackers. And who was it come into the world and said, I am the bread of life? And isn't it the job of the Holy Spirit to reveal Christ to a lost world? And what means does the Holy Spirit use us? He uses you and I. Many in the world want satisfaction tonight. And yet we have to tell them, now none but Christ can satisfy. We, we tell them, yes, there's pleasures of sin for a season. But sin has consequences. Sin pays wages. Sin will take you further than you want to go. Sin will cost sinners more than they want to pay. Sin will take them further than they want to go. Where do you go to be satisfied? You go to the table of showbread. You go to Christ. Because none but Christ can satisfy. Th think also of the altar of incense. Think of the priest and he's coming. He's got a container with burning coals from the brazen altar. <coughs> he pours over those burning coals this lovely incense. And it produces a lovely smell. 
And in the inner court, there's a sweet perfume. There's a lovely fragrance. It's full, fills the place. And what you're getting is a picture of the prayer life of Christ. Yes, he's the blood sacrifice of his people. Yes, he's the eternal word that we need. Yes, it's true, he's the light of the world. Yes, he's the bread of life that truly satisfies. But we're here, we're getting a picture of his lovely, perfect prayer life, which is most pleasant in the nostrils of the Father. You can study his high priestly prayer in John 17. And I, I'm often struck with the words in the book of Hebrews, in Hebrews 5 and verse 7, <laughs> about the prayer life of Christ. L listen to these words. Who in the days of his flesh, that was in his body, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death and was heard in that he feared. Do you know that tonight in heaven the Lord Jesus is still praying. He's praying for you this evening. There's a beautiful fragrance and aroma rising up around the throne of God. And the Bible tells us of the Saviour he ever liveth to make intercession for us. Haven't we said to our missionary friends we'll pray for you. We have the best intentions. And the truth is, we've forgot. I I've forgot. I've failed in that score. But you know what? You can count in Christ. Where would we be tonight without his prayers for us? Isn't it the prayer life of Christ that <coughs> sustains and strengthens us through the Spirit? Without the prayers of Christ would fall flat on their face. Without the prayers of Christ, many of God's people would be found in the pub or back in the bookie shop or, or down in the, club, the, the, the clubs of dens of iniquity. And here's Christ and he's, he's interceding for us in heaven. He's the person who saves us. He's the person who keeps us. We don't keep ourselves. Very quickly, let's come to the most holy place. And what's in there? One item. The Ark of the Covenant. What's inside? The Ten Commandments. That represents the righteousness of Christ. He kept the law of God perfectly for us. He's absolutely sinless. And on account of his righteousness, that keeping the law perfectly for us, he earned righteousness for his people. And when we trust him as Lord and Saviour, the righteousness of Christ is imputed to our account. And of course, in the Ark of the Covenant, there's a pot of manna. And all that we need for life, everything, all the provision, supply, Christ meets the need. He's Jehovah Jireh. And then you've got Aaron's rod that budded with awesome, a, 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 almond blossoms. And there's a picture of Christ in his resurrection. When you think of the lid of the Ark of the Covenant, it was sprinkled by blood once per year by Israel's high priest. Could you imagine a high priest entering without blood? Judgment would fall upon him. He would die instantly and yet tonight isn't it amazing how that there's many who want to try and approach the God of heaven with a bloodless sacrifice they came they offer the fruit of their hands but it's only in the ground of the shed blood that we can meet with God think of these words destroy this temple and he was thinking about his body as a temple and just as there's three parts to the body, his physical body, the, the, the soul of Christ and the spirit of Christ. And it ties into what we're saying. Because that <laughs> temple is a picture to introduce us to Christ. Remember the day he died? He cried, it is finished. He then, the Bible tells us, does Mr. Spirit give up the ghost? He said, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. I believe the Lord Jesus chose the exact moment, the exact time, the very place where he would die on this earth and shed his blood. The particulars of this temple. Notice very quickly the period of this temple. Remember what I told you? If you go back to John chapter 2, look with me at the verse 20. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and will they rear it up in three days? Herod's temple, 
after it was built, it was Zerubbabel, Nehemiah, and Ezra, and others, it had fallen into disrepair. From 20 BC, that's 20 years before Christ, Herod was repairing and restoring the second temple. It took, as I've said, 64 years. So that's a span of 84 years. That means it was only operational six years. A beautiful building, magnificent. And yet, six years after it was fully restored and repaired, it was destroyed by the Romans under Titus in 70 AD. And if you go to Jerusalem today, you'll not see the temple. Oh, you might see evidence of its walls. Think of the Wailing Wall. You'll see the Dome of the Rock, of course. That's the Muslim place of gathering. They they lay claim to that. But the Lord Jesus was not referring, of course, as I've said, to a material temple, a physical temple. He was referring to his body. And he said, destroy this body. In other words, bring it down into the depths. Bring it down into depth. And bring it down till its blood is shed. And in three days, what's he going to do? I will raise it up. Of course, this was a reference to his resurrection. Notice the words, I will raise it up. You see, the, 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 one of the wonders of the resurrection is the Lord Jesus raised himself up from the dead. Do you ever hear of that? We read in the Bible of the dead being raised. Jairus' daughter when she was age 12. Lazarus, a dear friend of the Lord Jesus, dead four days. But it was Jesus that stood at the tomb and said, Lazarus, come forth. Think of the widow of Nain's son. He was about to go to the place of burying. And James, Jesus stopped the, the coffin and the funeral procession and raised the young man from the dead. But they didn't raise themselves. The Lord Jesus said, I will raise it up. And I, I think it's significant in John chapter 10 and in the verse 17. He, he says, Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. It's true the Father was involved. It's true the Holy Spirit was involved. But in this occasion, Jesus said, I will raise it up. In other words, Even though I'm crucified and my blood is shed and I'm truly dead, by my mighty power, I will bring about my own resurrection. The Lord had power to raise himself up. Now the three days, of course, was to the Jewish timetable. The Lord Jesus gave life to himself. He could have taken three seconds, could have taken three minutes, three hours, but he chose three days. Why? Why? He had power to choose when he would come back to life. I believe he deliberately had three days in mind to prove that he was truly dead. And after three days, to prove that he was truly alive by an act of his own will. Leonard Ravenhill, and you've heard me making reference to Leonard Ravenhill, and Wesley's not here, and he was converted under this man in Northern Ireland many, many years ago. And as I said this morning, he wrote a book by Revival Tarries. He wrote many good books, and I'd recommend his literature to you. But he said this, Christ didn't die to make bad men good, but dead men to live. And dead men need life. And if the Lord Jesus raised himself up from the dead by his own mighty power, then he has power to raise you spiritually from the dead and give you life, even the life of God in your soul. And if you have life, you'll have a hunger and a desire and a thirst for Christ. The period of this temple. Yes, it was crucified and was shed blood. But glory to God, the period for this temple was In three days, it was gloriously resurrected. And the Lord Jesus was literally resurrected in the same body in which he was crucified. And when you get to heaven, you'll see and bear the the, the evidence of the wounds on the body of the Lord Jesus. It's a real tangible, physical body, um, uh, a glorious resurrection body uh, uh, to the praise of the Lord. And I want you to think of this as we finish. Think of the power of of this temple. Now, this really struck me. You see, this was not understood. 
destroy this temple. And in three days I'd raise it up. It wasn't understood by the Jews. Verse 20. But did you know as well, it wasn't understood by the disciples at the time. Look at verse 22. When therefore he was risen from the dead. That's three years later. His disciples remembered that he had said this unto them. And they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. In other words... It wasn't until he was actually risen from the dead three day, or three years after <coughs> this event had taken place, this saying had been made, that this uh, text had been uttered, that the full significance of what had been said then dawned on their hearts and their minds. Now, now get this as we finish. For three years this was a dark saying. For three years this was a daft saying. Destroy this body or destroy this temple and in three days I'd raise it up. You can imagine what the disciples were thinking. It lay asleep in a sense in their hearts and minds. It was like a little seed in a sealed tomb. But what do we read? After his resurrection, his disciples remembered that he'd said this unto them. And they believed the scripture and the word which he had said. And so often, folks, I'm thinking of those that have grown up in the Free Presbyterian Church, who no longer sit amongst us, neither in Sabbath school, in Bible class, in church services. And some of you have family members, and it's hard to get them in. And sometimes you think, it's, well, it's almost impossible. And they have been instructed in the ways of God in our children's meetings, in our Sunday school. They have been instructed through the preaching of the gospel that they have heard. And they maybe have even come into contact with preachers on pastoral visits. And I want to tell you, it's not all wasted. It's not all in vain. It's not all forgotten. Because there can be a resurrection of that truth. There can be uh, that, that fact, uh, that, that text that was said, that sermon that was heard. Even after many years, it can be brought to bear upon them by the power of the Holy Spirit. And through that they can be brought to faith in Christ. That's the power of this temple. Now does not give you encouragement to pray on. Does not give you encouragement to try your best to get your loved one under the sound of the word of God. Let's believe tonight that our labor is not in vain in the Lord. Whether it's in the Sunday school work. Whether it's in our children's meetings. Or whether it's in our ongoing services. As Ryle says in his commentary, let the preacher go on preaching. Let the teacher go on teaching. Let the parents go on training the children. Cast thy bread upon the water. For after many days, you'll find it. And that's the encouragement that we get from this thought. Destroy this temple and in three days I'll raise it up. He made a statement and three years later, it was brought home to the disciples. The power of this temple. May the Lord take these few thoughts.